MegCram.com. Welcome to another MegCram video. We're going to talk today about the low-carb fruit fallacy. And what is that fallacy? That fallacy states that 39 grams of sugar, for instance, in this soda, is the same and has the same effect as a similar amount of sugar in a whole fruit product. People will say, look, fructose is fructose. Sugar is sugar. It doesn't matter how it's packaged. It has the same effect because the liver's got to still deal with that sugar in the same way. And what I'm going to show you today, looking at data, is that that is just not the case. And it's a fallacy. And it's not just a fallacy with dietary low-carb physiology. It actually is something that's much wider. And a lot of the pharmaceutical companies also fall into this situation. So what happens is usually they'll find some sort of substance in nature that has a known benefit on the human body. So there's our substance in blue there. And what will happen is, is that this substance effect is measured and is something that we can see in the human body. But because it's in nature, it is surrounded by factors like W, X, Y, and Z. And this is its form in nature. But that's okay because we can extract it, take it out of its environment, isolate it, and here we have it. And we decide that we're going to concentrate it, package it, patent it, and think it's going to have exactly the same effect. And of course, there are financial incentives for this to happen because if you can isolate a compound, which is very beneficial to the human body, then you can make a medication out of it and sell it. So the problem with this is that there's this understanding that something is just the sum of all of its parts. That's not the case. In fact, there's a term for the opposite understanding of that, and that is the term gestalt. Gestalt is something that is made of many parts, something in nature, and yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts. Here we have the substance in question. But what we're not taking account when we isolate it is that that substance interacts with things around it. So in the terms of dietary situations, we've got the gut here, and there's many ways in which X, Y, and Z, W, X, Y, and Z could affect this substance, right? So it could hold on to the substance longer so that it takes longer for it to be absorbed, or it could be co-absorbed it could facilitate or prevent its absorption in the bacteria which line the gut. We call that the gut microbiome. And that's a pretty important effect as well because the gut microbiome contains as many single cell organisms as there are cells in your body. And so the point is, is that even though you may have the same amount of weight, let's say in this case it's 39 grams of the substance here, you can see that potentially there is a way that this might interact differently even though there's the same amount of weight of this substance here in the natural product because of these other factors that are going on. So let me give you a couple of examples where this actually happened. Here is a substance known as beta carotene, which is found in a lot of colorful vegetables and fruits, by the way. You can see it's an aromatic compound because it's got a lot of these sp2 hybridized electrons here. And because of that aromaticity, it can actually be lipid soluble and go through membranes quite quickly and interact with DNA promoters. And it was because of that, that beta carotene actually was thought to prevent cancer. And this is a paper that was published in June of 1988, so quite a while ago. And this is what the abstract says. It says, the possible role of beta carotene as a protective nutrient against cancer is reviewed. Human prospective and retrospective studies strongly indicate that beta carotene protects against lung cancer and probably against stomach cancer. It may also be protective against cancer of the ovary, cervix, breast, and other cancers, but not the colon or rectum. The protective factor appears to be beta carotene itself rather than total vitamin A. Experiments using a variety of animal models also show that beta carotene is anti-carcinogenic and appears to act at several stages of the process. Possible mechanisms of action are discussed, namely that it must first be converted to vitamin A, that it alters carcinogen metabolism, that it is an antioxidant, and that it enhances the immune defenses. So in 1988, they felt that they had it locked up, that beta carotene looked like it prevented cancer. And they had a number of benchtop studies, but also the fact that there was a number of studies that showed that people who ate things high in beta carotene seemed to do better in long-term observational studies. So again, here's our beta carotene in the natural world connected to other factors like W, X, Y, and Z. 
So what they decided to do was to take it, isolate it, and feed it directly and see whether the effect was the same. Well, let's jump six years ahead to 1994, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the title is The Effect of Vitamin E and Beta-Carotene on the Incidence of Lung Cancer and Other Cancers in Male Smokers. So this is a randomized controlled trial, 29,000, and this is what they found. Unexpectedly, we observed a higher incidence of lung cancer among men who received the beta-carotene than among those who did not, and that was an 18% increase. And the 95% confidence interval did not include zero. And so in this case, this was statistically significant. So their conclusion was, we found no reduction in the incidence of lung cancer among male smokers after five to eight years of dietary supplementation with alpha tocarifol that's basically vitamin E, and beta-carotene. In fact, this trial raises the possibility that these supplements may actually have harmful as well as beneficial effects. And this one was published in 2015, Vitamin E Intake and the Lung Cancer Risk Among Female Non-Smokers, a report from the Shanghai Women's Health Study. This was a study looking at diet versus supplements, 72,000 subjects in this. And here's what they found when they followed up. They said after 12 years of follow-up, 481 women were diagnosed with lung cancer. Total dietary tocopherol was inversely associated with lung cancer risk. That means the total dietary tocopherol, the higher amount it was, the less chance of getting lung cancer in women, meeting the dietary guidelines for adequate intake. But what else did they find? They said in contrast, vitamin E supplementation, which is tocopherol, was associated with an increased lung cancer risk. And that was 1.33, and the confidence interval was between 1.01 and 1.73. So they say here, in summary, dietary tocopherol intake may reduce the risk of lung cancer among female non-smokers. However, supplements may actually increase lung adenocarcinoma risk and requires further investigation. What they're saying here is that when vitamin E is substituted here for the substance, that these effects are actually not different, but actually the opposite, the opposite effect. So vitamin E in nature has a completely different effect than vitamin E given by itself. These results reinforce the importance of getting nutrients from foods rather than supplements. Other studies have found similar effects. For example, the Select trial found that vitamin E supplements increased prostate cancer risk in men. Likewise, AICR and the World Cancer Research Fund research has found that foods containing carotenoids decrease lung cancer risk, while beta-carotene supplements increase lung cancer risk in smokers. And so the question today that I raised, again, is this low-carb fruit fallacy, which is that the substance of fructose given freely as a dissolved solvent in a solution does that have the same effect as fructose that is complexed with fiber in whole fruit? Let's take a look at the data to see if that is in fact the case. And before we get started on this, I just want to make sure that you are aware that we've talked about high fructose and oxidative states before. In our award-winning series on COVID-19 and our Update 83, which was published about two years ago, showed very specifically that high use of high fructose corn syrup in food, first of all, was very high in the United States and correlated with oxidative stress. And so I am not a big fan at all of added high fructose corn syrup or added sugar in general. In fact, we showed in a similar video here that fructose increase not only inactivated vitamin D in both cases to the 2425 dihydroxy vitamin D and the 125 trihydroxy vitamin D, but it also limits the activation of 25 hydroxy vitamin D to the active form to make the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So high fructose in its pure state is not a good thing, especially when it is an added sugar. But that's not the question today. The question is, is fructose or sugar that is complex naturally in whole foods have the same effect as this high fructose sweetener that is put into processed foods? Again, the question that I ask is, does 38 grams of sugar that you would find in two apples have the same effect on the human body that 39 grams of sugar in a cola can have? And so to do that, let's look at whole fruit specifically. So if you actually look very carefully at whole fruit, 
what you will see is that there are compartments that are set aside. Like on a submarine that has compartments that can lock down certain areas, these are smaller quanta of packaged sugars that are released a short amount at a time. You can see here different species of apples that you can see at this web address for this study. And you see when it's very early, when it's expanding, and finally when it's mature, you can see here that there are pockets. And these pockets are made up of fibrous tissue, otherwise known as fiber. So this would be sort of like our factor W, X, Y, and Z. And potentially how it might interact with this sugar that is in this whole fruit. Dr. Stephen DeVore, who is the Director of Performance Physiology for MIT and Ohio Health, and an Associate Professor of Exercise Physiology, Department of Human Sciences, and the Department of Physiology and Cell Biology at Ohio State University, said this specifically about fruit and fructose in fruit. Quote, it is literally the physical form and structure of the carbohydrates that matters. Simply put, a whole natural fruit is composed of unbroken cell walls that intertwine and bind the natural sugar to the natural fiber. When those cell walls, their physical structure, is not broken down in processing, it requires a greatly increased amount of time for your own digestive system to break them down and for the natural sugar to enter into your bloodstream. This results in a much slower rise in your blood glucose. The intact cell wall structure is the key difference between a whole natural fruit and a smoothie or fruit juice. That's really important to understand. Fruit juice actually cracks open those cell walls and allows that fructose to come through at that time. Whereas the whole fruit that you chew and then swallow has to be broken down slowly. He goes on, for example, two whole apples may contain the same amount of sugar as 12 ounces of apple juice or a 12 ounce can of soda. However, rates of digestion, absorption, and rise in blood glucose caused by the natural sugar found in the whole apples are significantly slower when compared with the added sugars found in the juice or soda. In my opinion, the best approach for your lifestyle nutritional plan is to think about and evaluate your daily food choices in terms of whole natural foods, not simply in terms of nutrients. What he's saying is you can't just look at the ingredient list. I mean, that's important to do, but it's not sufficient because there is a difference when this substance is by itself versus when the substance is in the factors that are surrounding it as it may be packaged in whole natural foods. So to demonstrate that, let's take a look at, for instance, a whole apple, applesauce, which is somewhat processed, and then finally apple juice where all of those cells are basically cracked open and the glucose is free to be absorbed. So what we're looking at here is serum insulin. How much does the insulin go up? And you can see that for the whole apple and the applesauce, it's very similar. There's hardly any difference. And in both of those cases, you can see here that the cells have not been cracked open and that there is a longer period of time over which this glucose is going to be absorbed, this fructose or glucose, depending on which sugar that you're talking about. However, the apple juice, where it is liquid, where the cells have been cracked open in the apple, you can see here that there is a significantly higher amount of insulin. And why would that be? Why is there a higher amount of insulin that is secreted in that situation? Well, it's because there's a huge bolus of sugar, as you can see here on the next slide. Here again, we're looking at the apple juice, the apple sauce, and the whole apple. As it goes up, blood glucose goes up, but because there is a higher amount of insulin that is secreted to meet that increased amount of sugar, the actual sugar itself goes up to about the same amount. However, because there is more insulin, because it lasts longer, notice that the apple juice causes hypoglycemia in those situations, even down to as far as 45 to 50, which is pretty low. Now, this is going to cause issues in the human body. The body does not like to have glucose go that low. You can imagine that if this were to happen over and over again from drinking apple juice or soda or things of that nature, the body is going to put into plan ways of preventing this hypoglycemic episode. And one of those ways of doing that is insulin resistance. Notice with the apple sauce and the whole apple, you do not get hypoglycemia. And so compensatory mechanisms like insulin resistance is not necessary. 
we're talking about exactly the same amount of fructose. However, when there is fiber that is surrounding the fructose and perhaps interacting in a way that it gets absorbed more slowly, that can have a very different effect than if we don't have that happening, for instance, in the juice. And that can be seen in this study that was published in 2008 in Diabetes Care titled Intake of Fruit, Vegetables, and Fruit Juices and the Risk of Diabetes in Women. This was 71,000 nurses, so this is a very homogenous population, and it was followed for 18 years from 1984. None of them started out with diabetes type 2 or cardiovascular disease. Eventually, after those 18 years, they diagnosed about 4,500 cases of diabetes, which was an incidence of about 7.4%. So what did they find? When they looked at an increase in three servings per day in total fruit and vegetable consumption, they did not notice a difference in diabetes incidence. Notice here that this range, this 95% confidence interval, is including one, and so there was no change. However, when they looked at whole fruit consumption, that was associated with a lower hazard of diabetes. Notice here that there was an 18% reduction, and that was statistically significant. Notice also that an increase in one serving per day in green leafy vegetable consumption was also associated with a reduction in diabetes. This was a 9% reduction. However, notice that fruit juice intake, that means no fiber, that means that all the cells were cracked open, that it was basically a bolus of sugar all at the same time, it was associated with an increased hazard of diabetes. And that was an 18% increase and that was statistically significant. So again, notice the conclusion of this study, that consumption of green leafy vegetables and fruit was associated with a lower hazard of diabetes, whereas consumption of fruit juices may be associated with an increased hazard among women. Again, we're consuming fruit and fruit juices, and notice that they have a very different effect, even though we're talking about the very same substance itself. So how the substance is packaged is just as important in understanding that that substance is there. And so I could say that fructose does not always equal fructose. There are other factors that are involved in terms of the effect on the human body. But you might say, well, that was an observational study and that doesn't prove causation, right? What you need is you need to have a randomized controlled trial. Well, here's one that was published in 2017 titled Plasma, Glucose, and Insulin Responses After Consumption of Breakfasts with Different Sources of Soluble Fiber in Type 2 Diabetes Patients, a randomized crossover clinical trial. Realize here that when you do a crossover clinical trial in a randomized fashion, that dramatically increases the power of the study. And so you don't need to have a lot of subjects in that type of study because each subject acts as their own control. So you don't need a lot of subjects to reach statistical significance. And so here in this N equals 19 randomized crossover design, which is very powerful and met statistical significance, they looked at an isocaloric, which means there was no difference in the number of calories and the same makeup as carbs, proteins, and fats between arms. And they looked to see what happened with these patients eating this breakfast in the morning. Let's take a look at the data. So here we have three different types of meals. We have an HFD, which is a high fiber from diet, diet, HFS, which is a high fiber from supplementation. That means they added something to the food that increased the fiber intake. And then we had UF, which is basically the usual amount of fiber. Now you can kind of look at this here with fiber. You can see here in the high fiber from diet, they had 9.7 grams of fiber. From the supplement, 9.1. And from the usual fiber, it was 2.4. What we're looking at here is what happened to blood glucose and insulin and things of that nature. Pretty stable across the board. So here we had similar amounts of protein in these different diets. We had similar amounts of fat in these diets, and we had similar amount of carbohydrates. If anything, notice that the high fiber from diet actually had more carbohydrates in it, but notice that the glycemic load was on par with the high fiber from supplements. And actually, it was lower than the usual fiber. And why is that? It's because of fiber. It's because of how much is available. So let's take a look and see what happened. Here we have the high fiber from diet, the high fiber from supplement, and the usual fiber. Let's take a look at the high fiber by diet because that's the one that you're going to want to look at. That's the one with the small diamonds. So it starts off at the very beginning of the meal, and we look at time here as we go across the x-axis. And what it did was it went first to here, then it went to here, then it went down, and then finally down to here. 
And if you actually add up the area under the curve, you'll see here that it had the lowest area under the curve. Even though in this case, the high fiber from diet had more sugar by percentage, it actually had the lowest amount of glucose in the area under the curve. Similarly, when we look at the amount of insulin that's secreted, again, we're looking here, we're looking here, here, and finally down again. And again, statistically significantly different and the lowest amount of insulin. And why is that? It's because of fiber. This is out of the scope of this video, but understand that fiber is extremely important for the type of bacteria that you have living in your gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is made up of good bacteria and bad bacteria, to be put simply. And good bacteria generally lives off of fiber that you cannot digest. Your bacteria digest those, and when you have good bacteria in your gut, that bacteria can break down things that you can't and produce things that you can absorb and are very helpful, things like polyphenols, antioxidants that are very beneficial for preventing diabetes. So once again here, we're showing that even though a particular food may contain the same amount of sugar, the way it's packaged has a huge impact on how your body deals with it. Here is another randomized crossover design, very powerful, 22 subjects in this. And all they did here was they just added dry banana fiber to a isocaloric milkshake that was the same. And what did they find here is that when they combined this with it, they noticed that they had a much lower glucose over time. And you can see statistically significantly, and the UB here was unripe banana flour shake. Fiber has a way of reducing the absorption, pulling it back, and that's very important. Here's another study looking at the odds ratio for metabolic syndrome, which is a surrogate basically of diabetes, very similar. And what do we see here? That there was no statistical significance except for fruit fiber, and that in terms of Tertile's source of fiber intake for fruit fiber, there was a very statistically significant reduction in metabolic syndrome if fruit fiber was added to the diet. And in fact, there was a dose response curve. The nice thing about randomized control trials is that you can specifically design exactly what everybody gets, but it's hard to do randomized control trials over years and years and years. So usually what we rely on there is observational studies because you can't put somebody in a randomized controlled trial for years. So when we look at this study that was published in 2017, it was a prospective observational study looking at half a million Chinese adults. And the title was Fresh Fruit Consumption in Relation to Incident Diabetes and Diabetic Vascular Complications. This was a seven-year prospective study of half a million Chinese adults. They looked at half a million, age 30 to 79, with a mean age of 51, and they found that there was about 9,500 new cases over seven years of diabetes. And this is what they found. Among the 30,000 participants who had diabetes already at baseline, self-reported fresh fruit consumption, adjusting for potential confounders such as age, sex, region, socioeconomic status, other lifestyle factors, body mass index, and family history of diabetes, they found that there was an 18% reduction in diabetes. And in those that never or rarely ate fresh fruit, at baseline. There was an incident diabetes of 6.4%, which is three times higher than the baseline diabetes group. Among those without diabetes at baseline, higher fruit consumption was associated with a lower risk of developing diabetes, and you can see that here, a 12% reduction, with a clear dose-response relationship. And among those with baseline diabetes, higher fruit consumption was associated with lower risk of all-cause mortality, and lower microvascular and macrovascular events. And there's nothing wrong with low carb. If you wanna do low carb, I think that's great. Where I think that we need to be careful is simply using the ingredient list to make our decisions and not realizing that there's a big difference in how sugar is packaged and therefore the effect on the human body as we've shown. And so I don't think that 38 grams of sugar in two apples is in any way similar to the 39 grams of sugar that you might get in a soda can. And actually, this is well recognized by organizations. This is Diabetes UK. They say that everyone should be eating more fruit and vegetables. And the reason why they're making that recommendation is exactly because of the studies and the data that we've just gone over. They say you're probably aware of the five-a-day target, and this is equally important if you're living with diabetes or if you're not. 
Again, Dr. Stephen DeVort, he says, in 2014, the World Health Organization released a recommendation that an individual daily sugar intake should not exceed greater than 5% of their total daily caloric intake. This resulted in many Americans questioning if the natural sugar found in whole fruits is counted in that recommended 5% total. The short answer is no. The natural sugar found in whole fruit does not count towards the 5% recommendation. The natural sugar that is contained in whole fruits is bound to and consumed in the presence of fiber. And it is the presence of this fiber in whole natural foods like fruits that makes it a critical difference in how your body reacts when they are eaten. When the natural sugar in fruits is bound to fiber, it results in your body absorbing and processing the sugar much more slowly. This slow breakdown of the food is different than what happens to the added sugars and sweeteners that are contained in many packaged and processed foods. So I hope we've explained clearly the low-carb fruit fallacy. And if you want more information on how to optimize your health, I highly recommend that you join us over at medcram.com where we have medicine explained clearly. We actually have a course called the Health Optimization Course where we have topics like sunlight and optimal health. We've discussed with experts such as Dr. Rhonda Patrick about sauna use. We've also talked with Peter Atia about detecting lung and other cancers early. We also talk about other topics like xanthan gum, the science of thankfulness, high serum sodium and chronic disease, and the mortality and diabetes long-term data in low-carb diets. We also talk about exercise and other things that you can do to optimize your health. So if this has been helpful, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us over at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.